Here we are in Palenque, one of the most important sites in the Maya world. Now Palenque is so important because of all its glyphs. Glyphs, of course, are the ways in which the Maya wrote about their gods, about their universe, about their kings and queens. Many iconic examples of the Maya use of glyphs are found in their temples. So it's a great place to begin our voyage of discovery into the ancient Maya world. I'm standing on top of the Temple of the Inscriptions. It's a mausoleum for Pakal. Behind me is the entrance to his tomb, and all around me are inscriptions legitimizing his rule. Maya writing is made up of about 800 known glyphs. Some of these glyphs represent numbers, others represent syllables, and a few represent ideas. The story of the decoding of Maya glyphs begins in 1832, when an epigrapher discovered that the bars and dots on some of these glyphs represent numbers. By the end of the 19th century, we discovered that these glyphs could be read in columns of two, from the left to right and from top to bottom. However, our effort to understand these glyphs was frustrated up until the 1950s, because most scholars thought that each of these glyphs represented a particular word. Instead, it turns out that these glyphs oftentimes represent different syllables in an ancient Maya language. Yuri Konorosov, a Russian, he suggested that he found a way to decipher the language, and it was based on a document that was a Spanish language document by a, a fellow named Diego de Landa, Bishop of Yucatan. He'd written a tract that had to do with Maya culture in general in the 16th century, and within it he included a syllabary, or really what he called an alphabet of Mayan hieroglyphs. Gunnarosa recognized, however, that it didn't really reflect letters. The Mayan script doesn't work according to an alphabet. It works according to syllables. So each of the symbols actually is a consonant-vowel pair. So instead of writing just B for the letter B, it would be Ba, and then there would be a separate one for Be, B, Bo, and Bu. And you would have these different combinations of consonant vowel pairs, which makes up his alphabet. Konorosov went, took that series, and applied them to what he can see in the Dresden Codex. There are logograms, which are essentially word pictures. That is, a glyph can stand for an entire word, and then there are syllabic signs that are phonetic, and you read them for their sound value. And I'll give you a sort of famous example of the word balam, which means jaguar. You could write the word jaguar by recording a hieroglyph that is a picture of a jaguar, and that would be enough to convey the entire word balam. There's another way that you could write the word balam. That is to have a hieroglyphic sign that stands for the syllable ba. So you take your phonetic ba sound, your water lily, and you combine it with two other phonetic signs. You would have one glyph that has the phonetic value la, L-A. You attach that to your ba sign. Then underneath it, you could add to the bottom another sign that has the phonetic value ma, M-A. You can read the whole word phonetically, ba la ma. The sanctuary inside the Temple of the Sun, here at Palenque, has glyph panels formed by three engraved slabs with a series of glyphs on both sides of the scene in the center. In the center, we can see a coat of arms with a representation of a deity known as the Jaguar God of the Underworld. In the hieroglyphic writings that accompany this scene, the left section refers to a mythical narration, whereas the text on the right refers to historical events. The translations of panels such as these have given us a more complete view of how leaders viewed important mythical events. For the Maya, everything that had happened to their ancestors was considered very important. Tatiana Proskoriakov, she was a Russian emigre to the United States. What she did was 
really brilliant in the way that it turned the game upside down. Praskuryakov goes back and he says, let's go back and look at those dates and look at the patterns at a given site and look at how they relate to the imagery on the stele that they are recorded on. And what she finds is that the patterns between the dates correspond to the kinds of events that would happen in people's lives. So a birth record, an accession to the throne record, and then a death record. And she finds that they match up in really provocative ways with the different clusters of stele at a specific site called Piedras Negras. So what she does is she takes that observation and puts forth what she calls the historical hypothesis. That what we're seeing here are intervals in the lives of individuals, and those individuals are rulers of the specific site. Epigraphers have managed to identify that the written glyph texts found in the palace at Palenque refer not only to mythical events, but also speak about real people in terms of the dates of birth or death and military events. Thanks to the hieroglyphic texts that are placed inside this courtyard and specifically on the hieroglyphic stairs, we know how Pakal gave an account of the centuries preceding his rule, when the city of Palenque fought major battles. Now, we can read many texts and really not understand what they mean. And that's because they're embedded with content, with religion, with ideas, with political conflicts, with all of the richness of historical documents. And so I think, personally, one of the next real advances that we're going to be looking for is for people who have that mastery of content and the mastery of the epigraphy, and they can look at both of them and see how understanding the material is just as important as understanding these words as they're written and the complications of the paleography of the script. Mm -hmm.